<laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was uh, interesting. It was an interesting way of making a movie with those guys, I have to say. But uh, yeah, I'm proud of the way it came out because it wasn't supposed to really come out. Jonathan Baker is a modern day showman. And he may be the only person that rivals Nicolas Cage in terms of eccentricities and pursuits. Here's how his company, Baker Entertainment Group, describes the former producer of FSN's World Poker Tour. Jonathan Baker has always been enthralled by smart storytelling and larger-than-life figures, taking inspiration from greats like Ernest Hemingway to guide his own sensibilities as a writer, producer, director, and adventurer. Studying film in his native New York City and at USC in his undergraduate years, Jonathan Baker began his entertainment industry career as a writer, director, and producers of projects such as Through Scavello's Eyes, a Warner Brothers documentary on the controversial fashion photographer Francesco Scavallo, Dorf on Golf, a sports spoof with Tim Conway, and Dirty Tennis, a comedy starring Dick Van Patten, Nicolette Sheridan, and Bruce Jenner that aired on HBO and Cinemax, winning the VSDA and New York Film Festival's award for Best Comedy Video of the Year. More recently, he founded Baker Entertainment Group, a multimedia development and production company based in Hollywood. Baker is also a successful entrepreneur who grew a startup venture, Skin Spa, into the leading full-service day spa in the U.S. before selling that brand in 2011. While focusing on Baker Entertainment Group and his evolving work as a film director, he remains active in the personal care field and has currently developed a new signature brand, Jonathan Baker, established 1962, the year Baker was born which introduces its first line of mini pure aromatherapy products. Jonathan's men's casual clothing line is due out next. But a deep internet dive on Baker reveals he's even more fascinating. His pheromone unisex cologne sold for $88 at Neiman Marcus. He wrote of the product, two decades ago, a curious phenomenon was born. The scent that I created has inspired countless love affairs. A unique blend of organic essential oils, powerful plant extracts, all organic, that drove unbridled passion in all it touched. Once discovered, never forgotten. 1962 by Jonathan Baker. The website even has an endorsement from Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, saying what Jonathan has created is simply amazing. Unfortunately, now you can only find the clone at a hotel he owns in New York that has had visitors like John Bon Jovi and Bill Clinton. When he's not at that hotel, he lives in Warren Beatty's old hilltop mansion, which just got renovated for $5 million in 2019. There's even more interesting things left out of his biography, like the Skin Spa offshoot Baby Skin Spa, which Baker declares on his YouTube page was ahead of its time. Sometimes it's stressful being a baby. You're constantly strapped into strollers and stuffed into car seats, and every time you try to get a word in edgewise, in goes that darn pacifier. So maybe it's time to do what your parents dream of doing. Relax. Take a spa day. We offer over 25 different services, ranging from baby massage, baby yoga, baby sign language, uh, brain awakening through classical music, uh, baby chakra chi. Yes, he said baby chakra chi. We take warm towels, we place them on the chakras, and we bring the baby to a calmness. The bio also fails to mention his controversial appearance as a contestant on The Amazing Race, with then-wife and playmate Victoria Fuller. Their prickly relationship led to a visit with Dr. Phil and a scuffle with Joe Rogan on Fear Factor. Uh, yeah, in my earlier days when I was on summer camp, yes, I was on The Amazing Race. Yeah, that was me, unfortunately. Yep. People, uh, I got portrayed in a really, really bad way, but it was, uh, you know, I guess I had done it to myself because I really, you know, I had broken the fourth wall on The Amazing Race and nobody had ever done that before. So um, I thought it would be interesting to tell the reality truth of reality television. And it kind of got, it, 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 it was a very interesting experience, that's all I can say. There's a reason Baker has such striking spots on these shows and off-the-wall ideas. He doesn't just want to be famous, he wants to be iconic. And in an interesting turnabout to that idea, 
Baker decided to step behind the camera to direct Inconceivable, starring Nicolas Cage. But Baker wasn't behind the scenes for long. He plays a minor role in the film and produced a documentary, Becoming Iconic, interviewing famous filmmakers, making their directorial debuts as he works on his directorial debut, Inconceivable. This is the story of Jonathan Baker, Becoming Iconic and Inconceivable. Director, Jonathan Baker. So I started with Lionsgate and I had two other films that I was working on. And Lionsgate had said to me that they would do my other films, they put them into true development if I would do a different film. And they introduced me to the production company and I kind of read all of these shoot 'em up movies and I just didn't want to do shoot 'em up. I mean, it would have been fun 20 years ago if I was single. It would have been fun if I really just wanted to have that kind of fun moment, you know, doing a shoot 'em up. But for me, I really wanted to do something that was more drama esque. And dramas are harder to sell than thrillers. Uh, so I was given a stack of scripts and Inconceivable made its way to the top. And when I got to it, I said, you know what? If you let me rewrite this, I think I can do something with it. Because the entire ending that you see is not the ending that was written. Uh, You know, I twisted it and I turned it and kind of made it my own. Uh, I did a lot of rewriting and, and I had said to them, okay, I'll do your movie, you know, put mine into development. And really that was the beginning of how this movie kind of took shape. Originally, Lindsay Lohan, Lohan was cast in it and announced, which I really liked her for the part. And I really wanted to see her do it. I, I love Nikki Whelan. I think that I got really lucky with her. I think she's a great actress. And I think that she really brought to the table the believability that the movie didn't kind of turn into something that you just were like, oh my God, uh, you know, what is this? And and so back to Lindsay Lohan, this, I fought for her and fought for her in the studio, basically at the end said, uh, we can't bond her. And so I had to kind of give up on that dream, but I fought for her out in social media for a while. It was pretty hard journey um, because I, I think that she's a really good actress and this would have really done something for her. And then Nikki Whelan stepped in and uh, uh, oddly enough, it was Nick who put um, Nikki Wheeland into the film. You know, he had said to me, I'll do the film if you really consider putting uh, Nikki into the lead role. And, you know, I looked at Nikki and I was like, wow, she's a comedy actor. How, how is this going to cross over? Because when you look at her reel, it's all comedy. And she's a really pretty girl. And I didn't think that she could really bring what she brought. I think they worked together one other time and I think they had some personal relationship that gave him the instinct that she'd be really right for it because he really was like, look, she's a kook and she's going to play this really well. And I really didn't know where that came from, but you know, I had to respect what he was saying enough to really look at her. And once I dove in and it took me a while but once I dove in, I could understand what he saw. And, you know, that it just, you know, sometimes things happen for the right reasons. And sometimes they happen for the wrong reasons. At this point, um, it happened for the right reasons. And I was really, really pleasantly surprised because the first day uh, that we shot was the end of the movie where she's banging on the glass. And, and so I was like, okay, I'm really relieved because if that was the second and Also, the day that I had my scene with Nick was the first day. So those two days really charged me and set the tone for the entire movie after that. That's why I said at the beginning of this conversation that it started out with so much drama. And then at the end, you know, there was, you know, it was just a straightforward movie, right? Because all everything came in the first five days. I think it's time she slept in her own bed. Mm, next week. I love you, Daddy. Oh, I love you, sweetheart. You really miss having more kids, don't you? We wanted a big family. Is she yours? 
She's really cute. I'm Angela Morgan. Katie Wells. Who's that? That's Katie, my play date. Here it is. Nice to meet you, Dr. Morgan. Right. Let's all raise a glass. I just feel like I'm part of the family now. My mom said Katie gives her the willies. Your mother doesn't like anyone. Why don't you just move to our guest house? You could also be our part-time nanny. Angela and Brian are gonna try for another kid. They're gonna use a surrogate. Wait, they're gonna ask me? No, me. What are you doing? They're my babies. You're sick. We won't have the family that we wanted. We're not out of options. Have you thought any of this through? What did Katie get out of it? She's very beautiful, isn't she? The last thing I want is for her to question either one of us. How old are your girls? They look just like you. Yeah, I get that all the time. She's not your daughter. This is your job. Yeah, to raise one of your kids and carry the other. You're hiding something, and I'm gonna find out what it is. I think she may be mentally unwell, possibly dangerous. Enough! We don't know anything about this woman. You're a drug addict. I'd rather die than have my child be raised by you. Endangered the baby. Katie has grounds for keeping him now. She's trying to kill me. You're pathetic. You accuse her of murder. Please stay away from me. You're gonna kill me? Kill us? The studio pushed it back to being a thriller. Uh, because it was easier for them to market. But I really took it from the drama standpoint. And a lot of the critics got pissed off that I didn't push the thriller, that I didn't take a different pace. But I didn't want to take that pace. I wanted it to be more dramatic. I wanted it to be um, <clears throat> more of this, what happens when you actually hire a surrogate and it's the wrong person, not the wrong person is a psycho and and tortures you and tortures you right so um and that's a very fine line uh to actually um show on the screen so for me it it, it was always you know here's a subject that's almost taboo and what do you do with it for me it was what happens when you have a person come in and you're too old and you need to do take the surrogate and the surrogate comes in and, and really has a bad past. Jonathan is very enthusiastic. He's, he's extremely excited about the material. He cares so much. He's a very sincere filmmaker. Um, he really wants this to, to fit within his vision and he doesn't, um, He's not afraid to, to speak his mind and, and stand his ground and get what he needs. And that's rare in uh, modern filmmaking because, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes it's the producers that run the show in this day and age. And he's really trying to make a movie, not a TV show. He wants this to be a movie in the grand tradition of cinema. You know, he, he, he cites like the 70s. He talked about, you know, St. Elmo's Fire with uh, Joel Schumacher, and he wants it to have style, and um, he's very clear about that, and I'm, I'm, I think we're going to see a lot of Jonathan. I mean, we knew that it was kind of a long shot for him to play a secondary role that wasn't a caricature of what Nick normally plays. So what I had done is that I had asked Nick if he would support the women. So really, it was the beginning of before the Me Too generation, but just after uh, the Oscars when Patricia Arquette was talking about equality and equal paycheck. And when I heard that speech, you know, I kind of used that to the benefit of these women and 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 the equality of the journey. And that's how I presented it to Nick that you know here you have these amazing talented women and the most amazing thing was that I offered it to all the women and every single time they would ask me who's the guy that we're playing against because I didn't really want that role to go to uh, to a superstar but at the end of the day it, the industry called for it. it it basically said you must have somebody for these women to play against 
that's notable. And so when I went to Nick and I presented the case to him, you know, he saw it. He saw exactly what needed to happen. And I think he did it for them. I think he did it for me. And I think he did it because uh, he wanted to show that he could actually be in a, just a straight movie and play a straight character because he'd come off so many kooky characters. On April 23rd, 2019, Nicolas Cage appeared in another infamous internet video. This time, he was singing Prince's Purple Rain in Koreatown. Let me managed to work his theory about the song Purple Rain into his character in Inconceivable. For me, mm -hmm. Purple Rain is actually a song about fatherhood. Really? Like when he says, I never wanted to be your weekend lover, like single fathers who don't get to see their kids as often and they want it more than that, you know? Thank God I'm not a single father. I think he had a lot of girlfriends uh, and stuff, didn't he? Was well, he I don't know, but that's how I see the song. I think we're so trusting. Right. <laughs> that's how we roll. Wow. Uh, yeah, he had asked me, when he came down there, if he could kind of just ramble on and, and, and I let him do it. And I thought that it was interesting that he chose those lines and it seemed natural, but maybe if you recognize them as improvised, maybe they weren't as natural as I thought. So Purple Rain, uh, you know, he's a fan of Prince and, and obviously that was on his mind and the lawnmower thing was, you know, it, it's just, that's just the way that he builds characters. I was amazed that he knew everybody else's lines, but the manager had told me when he was, uh, in Europe, uh, before he came to set, uh, you know, don't make any more changes once you sign him off because you're going to screw up his performance. So I was, you know, kind of taken back by that until I saw him. And then we talked about it. And then I, I told him what my concerns were. And then he was able to make the changes on his own, you know, so I didn't have to kind of put them on paper and force him to make those changes. You know, unfortunately for me, he played a pretty straight character. And in most of his movies, he plays you know, a really out there character. And uh, boy, did I wish that he could have done that. But the role called for a really straight guy. And when I got a hold of Nick, it was really, can you support a woman's movie? It was before the Me Too generation. It was before uh, e equal paychecks. This was, hey, uh, let's see if we can get a movie together with these amazing actresses and make an amazing movie. And he, you know, being a second lead, not the first lead, uh, had to make a decision of whether he wanted to actually be in that role or not. And, uh, you know, and he did, and he wanted to support the actresses, Faye Dunaway and Nikki Whelan uh, and Gina Gershon. And, you know, he did a great job. I was amazed at his candor and I was amazed at his professionalism. Working with women, you know, as much as I love to work with them and boy, you know, they give great performances. They take three times longer to get done. So, and so there was nobody on the set except for him and I that were guys. So we would show up, you know, really early and it would just take a while for the girls to come out of the trailer so he and i spent a lot of time together well you know first of all the character doesn't have a gigantic arc it has a very small pop towards the end um and that was really written on paper i gave him the choice to kind of make his basic choices um Bay dunaway who came on to the movie uh, at the very beginning, had broken her leg like three days before, and they wanted to replace her, and I had said no. And then they had said, hey, we want to put her in uh, a wheelchair, and I said no, uh, that I wouldn't do that to her. So what I did was I rewrote the entire movie so that she's sitting down the entire time. So if you rewatch the movie, she's never standing up. And I think that Nick really liked having her as her mother, 
And I think that uh, in his character development, he really took it from a very simple, natural pacing. And again, because it wasn't an out there character, I didn't have to do much. I just needed to make sure that when he got to the end, that his emotions changed enough that we kind of believed that Gina Gershon was uh, in trouble. When Nick came to the set, he was charged with emotion. And by the time he left the set, <laughs> there wasn't enough emotion that could keep him there, uh, which is really funny because he's so used to playing these characters that are just way out there. And, you know, it, and I had to concentrate on what the movie was and what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. And when we got to the end and I showed up to do my scene with him, I was like, wow, you know, he's really uh, has a handle on this character. And he, you know, he really took it and and twisted himself into that emotional pain that you see. And that's just a tribute to how good of an actor he really is. I mean, he, he, he really is a great actor. But you know, one in five guys enjoy mowing their own lawn, and I'm one of them. You do? <laughs> you have a lawn He's mower? A mower? Well, I, I enjoy it. It relaxes me. Well, listen, let's all raise a glass I do. and toast the beginning of another wonderful summer yes. and all our friends who always make it so special, the tried and true. Thanks, Brad. I see you, Bear, okay. and the new. Everything I'd hoped for did come out in that moment because I thought that if I didn't put myself between them, that they would never respect me as a director. So uh, that's why I kind of put myself between them so that they would help me and help each other. And it really did work out pretty well because I, I mean, you'd never know that anybody was acting. You would have thought that that those moments at the table were just so natural and there was such a natural flow to it that again, he was, Nick was a great leader and Faye Dunaway being such a great legend um, that's what made the movie what it is, uh, because if not, the movie would have just kind of crawled up and, you know, died in some corner because no, there's so much out there today with Netflix and Amazon, HBO and Showtime and, and, and iTunes. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how much content is out there. So, you know, anybody who's watching your movie at any time today opposed to yesterday, you know, you're just thankful for that. The sister had no choice but to break up with the poor boy. Huh. You know what I always say, <laughs> if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> what am I, I was happy with my performance. I mean, some people were not happy with my performance. Um, I, you know, my role was really simple and, um, and being an actor against them was a interesting way of finding myself and finding the character because I believe that as a director, if I didn't put myself in the movie, I would not have gotten the same respect. And maybe the actors would have then just walked all over their parts and the movie. Um, but I didn't get very good reviews in certain areas and others I got, you know, really great fan reviews. So it's hard to tell if somebody else is doing my role if they would have made a difference or not. I think because I was the novelty, um, I think it was interesting uh, the way everybody played it against me and with me. In another uncanny resemblance to Nicolas Cage, Baker already has his burial plot picked out. Baker hopes it will be just one more reason that puts him over the top and makes him iconic. I'm a little eccentric, you know. I believe that life is by design, and you kind of reverse everything. Um, the story behind that is um, so Hugh Hefner was a friend of mine uh, for thirty, thirty some odd years, and um, I would have I played gin with him every Wednesday, and uh, we would watch movies Saturdays and Sundays, and you can imagine at the Playboy Mansion how much fun that was for a very long time. And one day, Half had told me that he is going to be buried next to Marilyn. And, uh, and he had already bought the plot. And I thought, well, this is interesting. 
So when I kind of I, I went to the cemetery, I saw what he was talking about. And obviously, maybe I wasn't supposed to know at that particular time. And, you know, he had never met Marilyn, which is a really interesting tidbit. And yet he she made him. And yet Hef was a friend of mine. And I thought it would be really interesting if I put myself above them. So it it goes, you know, me and then Hefner and then Marilyn. But I also bought it because Marilyn Monroe's name is Norma Jean Baker. So uh, and I'm Jonathan Baker. And more important than that, she died in 1962 and I was born in 1962. So I thought this was a little too canny. So when I bought it, I put it up there for you know, to be eccentric and to really triangulate what I had just said to you. But nobody really asked me until I did my documentary. And then I told the same exact story uh, in the documentary Becoming Iconic, which is the story of, of the drama on Inconceivable. I'm proud of Inconceivable. More because of Inconceivable, I get to do Icon, the film that I've been trying to get made for 10 years. And the greatest part about this entire experience is I get to arrive. Becoming Iconic is um, with Warren Beatty and Jodie Foster, Taylor Hackford, uh, John Badham, Adrian Lyne. I mean, some of the top, top directors of their time telling the story of their first time directing as I did Inconceivable. I thought it was really interesting, but really at the end of the day, I felt that there's no way to become immortal except to make yourself immortal. And if I never take down the Stay Tuned, because it says 1962 to Stay Tuned, and if I never take that down, then I get to be immortal. So that's why I left it up there. And the twist of it all is, I'm probably going to be cremated and thrown half of my ashes up in Big Sur, California, just over the over the edge of uh, of the cliffs up there. So, you know, um, when you're in Hollywood, it's a it's always an eccentric journey, especially if you're a storyteller. When you watch Becoming Iconic and then you watch Inconceivable, the entire journey really does make sense. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of one of my favorite stories on the set of Nick is when I got him the Harley Davidson and I had him pick which Harley he wanted, and Gina Gershon came out as Gina Gershon saying, I, "If I was a doctor and you were a doctor, I don't believe that you'd be riding a Harley, and I wouldn't let you. The character wouldn't let you." And I was, you know, Chloe had written that in there, and I thought it was kind of fun because it gave Nick a little bit of an edge, and so the three of us really were in turmoil as to whether or not we should let this character ride a Harley, especially in a state where there were no helmet laws. And um, and so when you see that scene, it's a scene that shouldn't have happened. And, you know, we, we, we were fighting over it because Gina didn't want that to happen. But at the end, I, we were the only two guys on the set and we wanted to have some fun. So we kept, we kept the Harley in there. I lined up five Harleys and said which one do you want to ride and we went to pick we picked one up and he picked what he liked for the movie and then we I picked one and then we went Harley riding the most important thing since you're doing this about Nick Cage is to realize how much of a consummate professional he is and how overlooked he gets sometimes because he takes these crazy roles or in my case takes the straight roles you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. But really, at the end of the day, he was the consummate professional. And he knew everybody's lines, and I was really impressed with that. I was impressed that he understood how to build his character 
against all the other characters that he had memorized their lines. So, um, you know, so when you watch him in other movies and you're watching him perform, realize that he knows everybody else's lines, that that whether he does a good job or a bad job in the audience's opinion, he really is or has taken the time to study the entire script and take the position from the director and take the position from the actor. All right, JonathanBaker.com. If anybody has anything to say, and uh, you know, I'm always open to suggestions, comments. My name is Jonathan Baker, and I am the director of Inconceivable. And yes, I work with Nick Cage.